So I wanted to welcome everyone. I'm Michael Simonson um, of the Leo Beck Institute. And I, I get to um, run this book club, among other duties I have here as the Director of Public Outreach and as the Director of Reference. Um, for our book, we are talking about a tome of a book this time. And um, I do not blame anyone who didn't get through it. Uh, the Books of Jacob. Um, by Olga Tokarczuk. Um, and uh, we have as a special guest with us today, um, Shmuel Feiner. So Shmuel Feiner is a professor of modern Jewish history at bar -Alan University and has the Samuel Brown Chair for the History of the Jews in Prussia. He is the author of Haskalah in History, The Emergence of a Modern Jewish Historical Consciousness, the Jewish Enlightenment, which was winner of the Correct Jewish Book Award, and Moses Mendelssohn, um, as well, which was published by the Yale Jewish Life Series, as well as various articles on the Haskalah in Germany and Eastern Europe, and also on secularization. So um, I wanted to welcome you, Professor Feiner, today, and um, um, I'd be interested to hear, I think we all would, uh, what background you can, can provide for us about this uh, epic novel, which, um, as I think we probably all know, won the Nobel Prize in Literature and the Man Book International Prize, many other honors as well. So, uh, Mr. Feiner, Professor Feiner, you could begin and just let me know when you um, are ready for me to continue. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you virtually for this LBI uh, book club. And uh, let me start with uh, a personal experience. Four years ago, I visited the city of Częstochowa, where my family used to live for many generations. This was a fascinating journey for me. I found the streets and the houses where my grandparents lived. In the cemetery, I found tombstones of remote family members. In the Jewish museum there, a very small but interesting Jewish museum in Częstochowa, I've learned how dynamic and pluralistic this community was at the eve of the Holocaust. How divided the community was culturally and politically between orthodox and secular, between socialists and capitalists, Zionist and Polish patriots, Hasidim. Many Jewish newspapers were published in Hebrew, in Polish, and Yiddish. And I also learned about the ghetto of Częstochowa and about the Jewish rebellion there. And I learned that few of the family uh, uh, members also were among the fighters against the Nazis. Częstochowa is a city on the Varta River, a city that looks upward to, uh, to the hill where the Yasnagora Monastery is. I saw the pilgrims walking along the main boulevard of Częstochowa in the way to the monastery. I saw the enthusiastic rel uh, religious feeling when the icon, the picture, of the Madonna was introduced to them, uh, the Black Madonna, which is considered to be the protector of Poland. And I also imagined Jack Jakob Frank walking on the walls of the castle. For him, it was officially a prison from 1760, but he made it a court, a Frankish court. And many, many visitors of his family and member of the sect arrived there. This was an unforgettable experience. The book of Olga Tokarczuk, which I've read in the Hebrew translation, which is a little bit shorter than uh, the English, uh, and a beautiful uh, translation. And by the way, in the Hebrew translations, a few of the mistakes made by the author concerning a knowledge about the custom of Judaism, they were corrected. But reading the book provided me with another strong experience. 
reading the book, you can uh, even um, touch Chenstehova. Chenstehova of the year 1760, 1772. She's so much alive in the book. You can walk in the streets. You can smell the smells of uh, uh, the church, the, the incense of the church. You can taste the different uh, uh, food. When I read, for example, that uh, Frank's servant was allowed to go to the city in order to bring in the chicken from the grocery sh shop of Shmuel of Chenstehova, I felt that maybe this Shmuel was uh, one of my ancestors that I'm called uh, after him. And reading the book, you can enter the intimate fear of the, uh, the, the, Frank, the Franky sect. And even to ex you could experience the very heavy erotic climate that uh, uh, was uh, uh, described as the bedroom of uh, Jacob Frank, who almost every night invited a different woman to his bed from those sisters that, that, that were, who were totally loyal to him. Of course, a very disturbing uh, uh, experience. So this is the power of this special book, which is very enjoyable, brilliant. Uh, it can, you can have this intimate experience, very close meeting with a, a strange world, mainly very dark world. You can feel, you can smell, you can taste, you can see. The book actually speaks to our senses. And like life itself, the universe of this book is full of contradiction. On the one hand, naked life of poverty, of sickness, of, of pain, suffering, persecutions, violence, uh, sex, and death. And on the other hand, magic, big expectation, big beliefs, mysticism, dreams about the Messiah, and so on and so forth. But when the reader is an historian like me, is also challenge. Because from the very first moment, Tokachuk tells us that this is an historical novel. And although the book is relied upon many documents and many excellent research uh, studies, she tells us that we should not distinguish between the historical reality and the fiction. That she also uh, uh, actually chosen fictional perspective, like the, fic the, the perspective of, of this uh, uh, interesting uh, figure of Yente, Jacob Frank's grandmother, which he, which she lives or, 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 or dead, you, you, we are not sure, she's between life and death. And she uh, took Yente in order to tell her story on the life of Jacob Frank. And in the last sentence of the book, we even read some mystical words saying that when a person deals with messianic issues, and even when this person, means, meaning the author herself, is only telling the story about them, she's actually investigating the hidden secrets of uh, the light. In the book, there are many accurate dates and many correct citations from the documents. But the historian who believes that his uh, mission is to uh, expose the truth via the sources, the original sources, the witnesses from the past, so maybe the historian should give up in this case on the effort to indicate what is true and what is not. To approach the book in the assumption that it's first of all literature, and it's not, it is not a, 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 something that could replace the historical study. Uh, maybe even a, a bigger challenge for an historian like me, that I'm investigating the rationalist movement of the 18th century, the Jewish Enlightenment, the Haskalah. And the movement that I'm studying 
wanted to transform the Jewish world and among others to reject the mysticism, Hasidism, false messianism. So how should I refer to this dark world of the Frankists? So I uh, would like to introduce a few points, a um, few points from the perspective of the historian of the enlightenment who reads the books of Jacob. The first point is that the historical novel of Olga Tukachok is a Polish book. If there is a message hidden uh, inside the pages, so this is the vision of inclusive Poland. Poland that is tolerate, uh, Poland that has no discrimination, a place that can enable uh, an interface uh, meeting. We know very well the discussion among German Jewry was the any time before the Holocaust a Jewish German symbiosis or was it an illusion as was argued by the famous Gershom Scholem. So the author of the books of Jacob would like to show that a Jewish Polish symbiosis was possible. She had she is very critical on old Poland. She's very critical on the nobility, uh, the nobility that didn't take any responsibility on the suffer in the state, the nobility which is responsible for the biggest historical disaster in Polish history, the uh, uh, partition of Poland among the three neighbors, Russia, Austria, and Russia, in the three partitions of 1772, 1793, and 1795, until they lost their independence completely. When Częstochowa was occupied by the Russian, Olga Tokhachuk writes that for the Poles, this was the end of the world. But Poland, Tokhachuk says in the book, is not just the aristocracy, not just the nobility, not just the Schlachta and the magnates, but also the peasants, the Jews, they are also part of the Polish Republic. And some of the heroes, the protagonists of the book are non-Jewish Poles. And especially she wants us to, uh, uh, to know this priest, Benedict Kremilowski, the author of New Athens, as one who uh, represents the Polish enlightenment of the 18th century. So the message is, uh, Polish, uh, Poland from a nationalist uh, point of view, but also liberal and enlightened. And of course, it has a big meaning and significant meaning in Poland of our times. The second point is, we well know that the Frankish sect existed alongside the emergence of the Enlightenment, meaning that movement for religious uh, revivalism, movements for religious enthusiasm and mystical movements like Hasidism and Sabbatianism existed uh, side by side with the philosophy of the rationalist enlightenment. So is the criticism of Jacob Frank on the law of Moses claiming that they are a burden and even a murder to the Jewish people is it a criticism of the Enlightenment? I believe that the book tried to, sh tried to show that this was the case. And Olga Tokachuk does something, uh, uh, something more very interesting, again, for me as an historian of the Enlightenment. And I would like to draw your attention to uh, the Dr. Asher Rubin, one of the Frankists who turned to be a, a, a maskil, and we meet him in the book in Vienna in 1784 where, uh, by the name of Asher Ascherbach. He knows European languages, he visits uh, coffee houses, he reads newspapers and articles, he knows the, uh, the encyclopedia of Diderot, he reads Moses Mendelssohn, and he even knows the recent uh, articles published by Immanuel Kant and, Mandel and Mendelssohn in uh, one of the most important periodicals of the Berlin Enlightenment as an answer to the question, what is 
enlightenment. Thus is aufklärung. Uh, you may also in, uh, 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 so in the book that Asherbach and his wife also believes in um, gender equality. So by that, the book actually shows us that there, there is an alternative way in Judaism to the traditional and rabbinical uh, Judaism that is depicted as frozen, and also an alternative to the radical and subversive Judaism introduced by Jacob Frank, and this is the way of the Haskalah. At the end of this chapter, telling us the story of Asher Rubin and Asher, Asher Bach, there is a very central and important uh, sentence if we want to understand uh, this insight of uh, Olga Tokarczuk when she says, when Asher Bach reads Mendelssohn, the first time in his life, he is satisfied of being a Jew. So how should we understand it? And now the third point. What was the position, the place of women in the Frankist sect? Was it an expression of religious empowerment that uh, uh, we can, could see in figures like Chava Shore and Eva Frank, or maybe the opposite, a, a, a humiliation? Profe the late professor Ada Rappaport Albert wrote about it a classical article and I uh, uh, believe that the author of this book didn't have, uh, couldn't read or, 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 didn't, or didn't read, she didn't know about it. Anyway, the book is written, so the books of Jacob is written from mainly from the perspective of women. The book is very sensitive to the humiliation by women by Jacob Frank. Just uh, uh, remember this terrible and very disturbing incident when Jacob Frank commanded girls, 12 years girls, to take off their clothes and he also touching them. So on the, uh, the book also doesn't conceal uh, the, imp uh, the impression of strong women those who are the bodyguard of Jacob Frank, this combination between power, sex, and violence. And also Chava Shaw, she is depicted in a certain way as a positive figure. She doesn't uh, actually, uh, uh, she's not afraid to demonstrate her sexuality. And remember, again, this very disturbing incident in the book when a uh, her breasts are sucked in her ceremony, which was actually an orgy, but she is depicted as a liberated woman. The Messiah is not a man, says Jacob Frank in this book, and only the maiden will be the true uh, savior. So point number four, another motive in the book is crossing borders. And that turns the different experiences to very exciting and daring. Men and women are crossing the borders of sexual morality and the prohibitions of the religion. Jacob Frank is crossing the borders of Judaism and the borders of Christianity and Islam. There is a cross, border crossing between a Muslim sphere and a Christian sphere from the Ottoman Empire to Poland. There's a crossing uh, uh, borders between impurity and holiness, between men and women, between earth and heaven, between reality and fiction. The prohibitions turned into commandment. And most of all is the crossing the borders between the religion. And I believe that this is something that, that Olga Tokarczuk wanted to fill in the book. Point number five. Uh, from uh, inspecting the historical facts, again, I, I said at the very beginning that we sh maybe shouldn't do it, but anyway, sometimes there are some that there are misleading uh, facts that we may uh, uh, should indicate. For example, in the book, uh, Jacob Frank is telling the parable of the three winds, which we are very familiar with. Uh, they are coming from. The, this parable is coming from Nathan Der Weise, a famous play 
uh, and of Lessing and uh, what uh, um, Jacob Franz does with this parable with the help of the author with Olga Tokachuk is very different from the intention or which intention of Lessing. Um, there are citations from the memoir of Solomon Maimon that uh, are given uh, in the book by Nachman, the scholar who became a Frankist. And the last point that uh, I find important to, uh, to emphasize, there is no historical basis to the descriptions of Eva Frank as the lover of the emperor Joseph II. Point number six, although this is uh, actually a Polish book, the author uh, uh, is very sensitive to the Jewish meaning of the Frankish sect. She understands, I think, uh, correctly the difficult challenge. Rabbi Chaim Rappaport, for example, in the book says, this time the, 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 our enemies are not a wild uh, Cossacks who threaten our lives, but some, some people were coming from, uh, from our own society. This time, this is the kind of a fight between brothers, and this is a, a, a disaster. For example, um, in the theological dispute in the group, in July 1757, when the Frankists argued the Jews are using the blood of ba uh, Christian babies in order to bake the matzot for Pesach, Pinchas is jumping up from his place and advancing towards Moshe the Frankist and is crying, Moshe, what are you doing? You are contaminate your own nest. Moshe, we know each other. We studied in the, in the same yeshiva. How can you do it to us? You know that this is a lie, that there is no uh, uh, truth in this blood libel. And the last point, but for me as an historian of Jewish modernization, very important. The Frankie Sefer is a chapter in the origins of Jewish secularization. In my book on the origin of Jewish secularization, I dedicated a chapter to the Frankie's uh, affair. The men and women of the Sabbatian sect breached the wall of supervision by the halakha and the rabbinical elite, particularly in those places where the wall was, its, its, was at its height, the secretion of the Shabbat, non-kosher food, chametz during Passover, breaking fast, incest and idolatry. Libertine behavior, the passion for bodily pleasure, hedonism and release from religious restrictions, was justified by the claim that the transgressions have a secret religious meaning, and that by committing them, a person proves his absolute loyalty to the sect. Many sources confirm the picture of the libertarian lifestyle of this sect. But what came first, and what gained the upper hand in this dissolute situation of the Fancy sect? Was it its adherence to the paradoxical idea of turning sin into a mitzvah? derived from the radical Sabbatian doctrine of mitzvah abba be'avera, that was the motivation for, uh, for permissive behavior and overstepping the boundaries of religion and morality, or was it the possibility to satisfy the desire for the pleasures and freedom of the body under the pretext of fulfilling a mitzvah? When men and women in the funky sex seduced one another and formed relationship based on forbidden, forbidden acts, they used religious reason. Sexual permissiveness was presented as a, full, as a fulfillment of religious commandment. The funky sect liberated the body in the name of an alternative religious consciousness of an already uh, redeemed world, but it was also blatantly defiant against prohibition and rabbinical supervision. From this standpoint, it was an expression of revolt against religion and a part of the contemporary radical trend of liberation the body. Jacob uh, Frank persuaded his followers to cast off all inhib inhibition, to desecrate everything holy, to violate prohibition. Gershom Scholem, that I've mentioned before, wrote about him the following. Jacob Frank will always be remembered as one of the most frightening phenomena in the whole of Jewish history. A religious leader 
whether for purely self-interested motives or otherwise, was in all actions a truly corrupt and degenerate individual, a powerful, a tyrannical, tyrannical soul living in the middle of the 18th century and yet immersed entirely in a mythological world. Out of the idea of Sabbatianism, Frank was able to weave a complete myth of religious nihilism. This is a citation from Gershom Scholem. And radical sexual license that he permitted himself with women his insistence on obedience, his domineering approach, and his hints about intimidation, humiliation, and violence mark Frank as a sadist, not merely in the metaphorical sense of the world. He was to a great extent the Jewish version of the notorious French aristocrat, the Marquis uh, Francois de Sade, the infamous libertine of 18th century Europe. In his personal life and his radical writings, the Sad was the defin definitive prophet of personal freedom and total abandonment of all the shackles and prohibitions of society, religion, and morality. The Sad and Frank lived in the same generation. There were only 14 years, that there were only 14 years between the two. Obviously, however, the life uh, context of the infamous French aristocrat and the Polish leader of the Jewish sect were totally different. It is extremely unlikely that the two ever met and there is no proof of any mutual influence. But Frank's behavior was characterized by Sadian libertinism. So what was, uh, and this is uh, towards the end of my uh, introduction, what was the historic significance of Sabbatianism in the 18th century? Many scholars of Sabbatianism have found in a trend that awarded the traditional religion in particular the radical release from the authority of the laws and the rabbis. Although Sabbatianism had at its center religious doctrines, ceremonies, rituals, and capital, capital, uh, Kabbalistic ideas in its social manifestation, it was first and foremost a revolt against religion to permissive and libertine behavior. From a broader uh, uh, viewpoint and as far as its cultural significance is concerned, the Frankist group also fit into the libertine world that existed on the margins of European society at the time. Radical Sabbatianism expressed the desire for freedom and autonomy of individuals who evaded communal supervision and behaved differently in opposition to religious laws and moral norms. At the same time, it had the capacity to arise in sense of danger among the traditional elites and to make them feel the need to prepare new strategies to cope with the threats and to set up barriers to keep out all manifestations of secularization. Thank you very much for your attention. Please like this video and subscribe for more content from the Leo Beck Institute.